Michael, welcome to the show. Happy to be here, Chris. Thanks for coming, man. Um, let's just dive straight into it. What? Uh, who are you and how'd you grow up and what brought you to Furnish? I love it. Start with a small question. Let's just go, baby. Loaded. I'm Michael Barlow, the co-founder and CEO of Furnish. We're a furniture as a service company based in Los Angeles, Seattle, and also now the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I Very excited to be out in Texas. Come on, baby. Come to Texas. How'd you get the idea? That's a good story. So the idea, it all started with a girl. Yeah. And that's how a lot of things. It's not a lot of things, especially like very (laughs) important things. Um, So my girlfriend at the time, this is 2017. Okay. She was living in Chicago and we were dating long distance and I was trying to convince her to move to Los Angeles, but the hassle and struggle of moving your life and physical assets is just so real. Yep. And the notion was, hey, well, how am I going to get rid of my furniture? Who's going to buy like X, Y, Z things? Sure, I have to find a job. Finding an apartment's actually not that hard, but the whole process of moving and building a community, and there's a lot of aspects. And so the idea is, how can I make it effortless to create and set up a new home in a new city, in a new neighborhood, with a new set of roommates, with a new partner? And there's so many friction points, but why does you know furniture and home decor have to be one of those friction points? Yep. And so not that I started the business specifically in 2017 to get you know my girlfriend at the time, who's actually now my wife. Yeah. Um, okay. Fair Denise, enough. it's a good story. <laughs> um, Denise to move out to LA, but that was that was the impetus. And from there, we were able to actually connect the dots. Like her and I had met in New York in 2010. Then she moved to Chicago. Then I moved from New York to LA. She was moving from Chicago to LA. And there's this period in time in a young professional's life, let's say call it seven to 10, maybe 12 years, yeah. where you don't know where you're going to live or settle down. You have some degree of uncertainty, professional and personally. And why should you have to buy on move, sell, store, furniture and the costs and the hassles and the time associated with that is sort of just very antiquated in terms of um, lifestyle. Yep. So were you looking for an idea? Did you you already have like a tech background or a startup background? Were you kind of looking for something to start and that finally was like the one or um, did this just kind of catch you by surprise? It was caught by surprise. I mean, I was in the startup scene out in LA. Okay. I had made that decision in 2015, started okay. my career in corporate, corporate finance, decided to move. Um, a good quote is, all loose marbles roll west. So, yeah. I, <laughs> so I, rolled, I rolled west from New York to LA from like a, you know, a high paying job in a Manhattan apartment to a, a literal garage in Venice, California, I joined a local media startup. We had a lot of excitement and optimism. It was like very much cutting your teeth on a startup grind. We ultimately raised $100 million with that business and it was off to the races. Yeah. I was one of the first handful of employees. So it was awesome. Um, so I had the bug, but I didn't have like the conviction around, hey, I'm going to go be a founder myself. I just hadn't had it yet. Yep. But when this idea came in early 2017, my now wife, myself and our, you know, my co-founder Lucas dove right in. We brought him in immediately because my wife was not going to start the business with me. She's in yeah. healthcare. Yeah. Um, How'd you know Lucas? Lucas was actually at that other startup okay. as well. And so we had built, you know, it's called Adam Tickets. We built a very good working relationship. That startup was really interesting, um, had really interesting DNA. It was essentially all ex Amazon engineers and product mm. folks. And then I had parachuted in to run um, finance and business development. Got it. And so it was me, like one other guy, a co-founder from, um, from this media company locally called Lionsgate, and then a bunch of Amazon folks. And so I got really close and just wanted to absorb and learn so much about like their lifestyles and how they cut their teeth because Amazon back in 2015 was growing super quick. It wasn't the Goliath that it is five years later, but yep. it was on its way. And so there's a lot of best practices there. Okay. So your girlfriend, now wife, is going to, uh, you're trying to get her to move. You have this idea. You realize the problem. Let's just spend a few minutes on like what, like literally what happened from there. You showed up to the office. You told uh, Lucas, right? Mm-hmm. You told Lucas mm-hmm. about it. Did you immediately go get a deck and raise money? Did you do like a prototype and just kind of tinker for a year? Like walk me through from, okay, I have this great idea to I've raised money and this is what I'm doing. 
And I, I don't know if there's, it's such a good question. I don't know if there's a right formula because everyone has its, its their own different path. I mm-hmm. think we, we spent six months in what we call like product validation, yeah. or market validation, which may or may not have been too long. Yeah. Probably not given we're doing so well now. Yeah. Um, but what we first did is we talked to, we found friends of friends or friends of friends of friends across 10 major cities in the U.S. So okay. from Atlanta to D.C. to New York to Boston, Denver, Dallas, et cetera. Um, Houston, we have some really good, what we call anecdata, really good stories that people told us around, hey, tell me about your experience moving. Tell me about your experience with furniture. Like, what are the pain points? What are your like, points of joy and delight? And we had so many hilarious uh, <laughs> anecdotes around like people leaving furniture in their apartments and just eating their security deposits people leaving their product on the side of the road and just hoping someone took it because they didn't want to like find a way to change hands on Craigslist for 10 cents on the dollar. Um, and there was just really very limited positive experience. <laughs> There's like zero. <laughs> zero, especially you know when you're 23, you're 27 or even 32. Yeah. And after that we, you know, we blanketed, we we used a a company called Mechanical Turk and so we bought some audiences and got a thousand data points around like more of a scripted survey response. Yep. Around hey, tell me about like 1 to 10 your experience with X like what product do you typically buy? It turns out so many people are buying IKEA product and just throwing it away and scrapping it because like they spend so much time building it, but doesn't actually move. It costs more to move than it does to buy new furniture. Mm-hmm. And so go through like four months of that validation. Then we focus a lot in the supply chain. What's the fur- global furniture supply chain? Where does it come from? How are we going to get product and manufacturers or wholesalers to actually work with us? And we went out to High Point. I mean, I mean, some really good, uh, some of the good stories. There's a there's a town in North Carolina called High Point. Okay. And they have this big conference and trade show, the biggest furniture trade show in the world in September, in the fall of every year. Okay. And so I took a couple of sick days yeah. at my other job, <laughs> went out and had this whole, like, we made a fake landing page called Furnish. We, and we actually stuck with our original name, which may or may not be rare. Yeah. Um, we had a whole landing page. We created business cards. And, you know, it was it was a fake company. But what I did is I had um, a couple connects in the North Carolina region that were able to set up meetings with furniture wholesalers and manufacturers. And I pitched them and said, hey, like, can we buy from you? Yeah. Like, can we execute a wholesale agreement? Would you be interested in working with our business? Talk to me about like quality standards on your product. And I left that trade show with like four vendors who wanted to work with us and thought we had a market niche in and around these young professionals who are, you know, not adequately served with the service economy solution for furniture. So I got back, I think, late September in 2017. And I called Lucas and I said, hey, like we have to go and leave and start this because we've been spending 30 hours a week on this for six months. And now we have a supply chain that wants to work with us. And so from there, we quit immediately in uh, like the last day of September, the first of October in 2017. We had a pretty good uh, reputation in the LA market, and so we were able to raise a million dollars out of the gate um, awesome. with him and I on five slides, which was a, a unique story potentially. And then off the races, um, we didn't waste all the initial money. I say we learned a lot with yeah. that initial <laughs> money, um, but obviously we've you know we've grown quite well since that time. Yeah, I uh, we've owned a lot of multifamily over the years. We don't as much anymore. I cut my teeth in student housing, and I. I would say almost 50% of students when they leave a student housing unit at the end of the year have left everything. Um, a lot of that's because it's probably got throw up and other stuff on it. I don't student know. Student housing, yeah. But students do not take their furniture with them or the majority of them don't. Um, all right. So you're, that's one. That's awesome. Okay. So you are, you're now moving. Uh, you've raised a million bucks. You're off to the races. Who are your customers? Is is it me moving, going, hey, Furnish, I'm moving to that apartment. Please put furniture there. Or is it a multifamily operator or a you know a big real estate owner going, I'm going to partner with you and then provide this option to people that move into my complexes? Or is it both? Yeah, I mean, it's a difference of like where we started in fall 2017 versus today. It's kind of a different equation. I mean, where we started was you know, I remember actually our first customer when we spun up our, our initial website it was actually spring 2018. Um, it was a third year medical student at UCLA. Her name is Habiba. And she found us and like we had we had a bunch of customers, but 
they were all like friends and family. So our first 30 and we all did Lucas and I did the initial deliveries and we had some like very manual, like PDF driven solutions. We were buying product off Wayfair and saying it was ours. Like it was, yeah. <laughs> it was very scrappy out of the gates. Like we didn't need a website to take our first, you know, take our first customers in 2017. Yeah. But I remember our first customer. And then I also remember like the first person we hired. We're like, wow, we, we got a customer. Like, that's amazing. How did they find out about us? I like, sent her an email and I was like, oh my gosh, tell me your story. And she's like, oh, like furniture rental just makes so much sense. I've just never thought about it in this context. Yeah. You know, I've always figured it was like, oh, super high price point or like super, you know, what I call like the La Quinta hotel quality, like, you know, very maybe 10, 15 year old product. There's no style bar. There's no like mid-century aesthetic. It's not something you're proud of. Yeah. Um, and that was something we very much focused on in the early days of the website. Interesting. So, was so early on it was just a one-off person saying hey i'm moving to la i move in in 30 days i'm renting furniture from you have it ready for me when i get ha- ha- have it ready for me i'm moving in a week i'm moving in with this new roommate um i saw your ad on instagram and it was that was like a really cool moment really cool moment but obviously again i can't celebrate every moment now yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, so if you are, if, if they're renting and, and then I'm assuming, do they sign like a one year lease with you for the furniture or do they rent for a year? Or like how's their, how's the contract work for that, for those customers? So they're going to sign a lease agreement. Okay. Um, and it's between two or 12 months. Okay. So we give some options. Two months. Yeah. We give some optionality. I mean, we've had a lot of, not in 2020 because summer internships weren't a thing, but when we launched our second market, the Pacific Northwest, uh, specifically Seattle, in 2019, we had like a ton of interns that came in for some of the big employers up there and they yeah. used our product for two or three month or four month rentals, which was a great taste because the idea is, oh, when you move back after your last year of college or business school, you're going to use our service again. Right. I mean, that flow will happen in the future. 2020 was a weird year. Obviously. Do they have to put together the furniture? Or do you guys assemble it and it's already ready when they get there? So we offer free assembly, delivery, and arrangement. And okay. so it's very much ties ties back to our mission around yeah. making it effortless to create your home. Yeah. And if that's the case, you shouldn't really have to lift a finger. I mean, we're a service economy solution. So we're laser focused on convenience and customer experience. Okay. And using that as a lens through all of our like training manuals, SOPs, and, and everything in between, we sort of have to do that. Yeah. And it's very differentiated, again, from one's experience with a flat pack build it yourself provider. For sure. Whereas you're spending two Saturdays in a row, one building literally a file cabinet because it takes five hours and two people to build a file cabinet from IKEA. And that's not a knock against them. Like yeah. you can buy it at a really low price point, it doesn't necessarily move. So that is a little bit on kind of where we started yep. the business. I think where we are today is. You know, very excited to be in Texas. Yeah. I talk about that a little yeah. bit more. Yeah, I want to know why you decided to come, but we can get there in a bit. Yeah, no, uh, very bullish on Texas. Also, like Fort Worth specifically. Yeah. Um, come on, baby. Understand your audience, Fort Worth, Chris. <laughs> um, you know, where we are today is we really have two sales channels. So we have that direct consumer experience through our website. And then we have, I mean, multifamily uh, apartment owners as a sales channel. It just makes so much sense. What better way to get in front of people at the right moment in time when they're moving in, signing a lease, moving out, like figuring out which roommates to live with, figuring out how long they're going to be in a specific city. It's kind of this whole surrounding the renter life cycle. And that's a real big strategy of ours. Which so tell, excited about. tell me about that relationship with the multifamily owner. So what's kind of your pitch to them? Partner with us when somebody's signing a lease offer the ability for them to have furniture rental while you're talking to them? It, it, as soon as they move in, like they, you know, they can tell you, they can tell us which pieces they have, which pieces they need, and it can be ready and arranged at move in. And, or look, that's typically what we call the the female driven experience. They yeah. like everything they plan in advance two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually really funny. And then, you know, guys, especially guys like with other guys and not to knock ourselves, yeah. you know, we all went to college and, 
uh, had our own experiences, but you know, we had two months when I first moved to New York City without a sofa or coffee table or anything. I was gonna say when I lived by myself, I'm like 99% sure that every single place I lived by myself, I was not unpacked for like nine months before I, I boxes still. <laughs> it was like by the time it was time to move out, I was just getting to the last box, and uh, yeah, I was never and then planning. He signed his one year leases, um, and it might be right, it might be end up being two years, yeah. But, Really, our relationship on the, you know, our, our, our pitch to the real estate operator is like, this is a, a core part of a premium resident experience. So it very much aligns with your mission and the resident experience you're aiming to provide. And so there's really no downside to providing our service. We also have a couple of tools and some revenue sharing mechanisms. I was going to say, what's in it for the multifamily owner? Totally. I mean, there, there's, there's a clear revenue share opportunity as an amenity yeah. or in a, like an affiliate offering, which is kind of core to our offering there. Yeah. But there's also, there's also like cool, again, resident experience nuances around like free interior designer services. Like we'll help you, like we'll help you in many ways lease up your building. Um, because we can give you differentiated points to talk to potential residents around. Like if you were going to be able to have a free interior design consultation with every resident that comes in the building, you know, that's something very cool that the person down the street probably doesn't have. Yeah, And that's a very like, okay, I'm helping them with their core leasing um, business now, as opposed to, oh, it's just like an ancillary revenue service, which how, is still helpful though. How are you doing the, 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 uh, design consultation? Is that through zoom? How, like how do people do that? Everything would be virtual. Yeah. Everything's virtual. And so we have it's a virtual world. It's a virtual world. It kind of maybe, maybe helps us, so to speak, being yeah. a floor plan from, um, from buildings where you have the relationship. And yeah. so how do you embed yourself? And we, you know, our strategy is very, local driven so region by region by region and i think that's an effective way to scale yeah. a business especially like an e-commerce business where e-commerce is you know sometimes very not locally focused yeah um but when you have like sales channel relationships it kind of takes that local approach so okay how much is the average person that would be renting furniture from you the alternative is they just go buy all their own stuff like I could either buy a bunch of furniture for X amount or I could lease a bunch of furniture for X amount. Like, what are the numbers there? Very much depends. Yeah. However, you know, we like to provide what I'd call maximum flexibility to folks. And so okay. we have product, we'll show you the retail price, we'll give you the choice to yeah. lease to own. And now, okay. you know, and if you make that decision, you're not going to be paying more than the retail cost of the furniture. So we want to make it a no brainer. Yep. in many ways. And so, hey, I don't know where I'm going to be in 12 months, but if I do actually end up falling in love with this living room set, I want to be able to know that, hey, I, I have the choice to pay the rest and own the product. Yep. However, like if you get transferred from Dallas to Denver, then you don't want to pay $3,000 to move product that only costs half of that from one city to another. You'd right. much rather say furnish set me up to spec with my new place in Denver, no moving costs, no hassles. And that's really where like, we future-proof a lot of uncertainty in people's lives, which is like, very interesting as you think about all types of durable trends, like rising mobility, rise in remote work, and how that's redistributed people across different cities in the US. And who knows how long people are going to stay in a specific city or a specific apartment. It is like, going to totally change with kind of these new trends that you know, this pandemic has kind of wrought on the U.S. Yeah, yeah. Have, um, if I move out and I've been leasing for a year, do y'all just come pick up the furniture? We do. And we then just take it back to the warehouse? We take it back to the warehouse. We have a logistics center in every market and we have refurb technicians. Um, and so we service that product. Sometimes we rebuild that product on a parts by parts basis with our you know parts based supply chain, which is kind of a super interesting operational challenge yeah. of our company. Uh, but we figured out one, how to get that body of knowledge to do it correctly and two, how to scale that body of knowledge, which is awesome. And then we'll put that, um, give the furniture a second life. Are most folks coming to you saying, I need everything? Are they like, look, I'm going to bring my bed and all my dishware and silverware. I just need a couch and a table. Or do most people say, I need everything? Or is it, you know, hit or miss? It's hit or miss. I mean, sometimes we have people say, I just need a sofa. Sometimes people need a whole bedroom set and a sofa. Yep. We have, we have some minimums and we have, you know, some terms that we ensure we meet to cover our own costs, especially on the logistics and the inventory side. But it's a range. 
Yeah. Um, but we like to be able, like, if you come to us, you need 26 pieces of furniture and you need it in seven days, like, boom, we got you. Yeah. You know, and you're, awesome. and if, you know, I just moved in with my wife, um, who now we all know, Denise. Yeah. Um, to a house. Prior girlfriend, now wife. Prior girlfriend, now, but you brilliant one. Yeah. Uh, my better nine tenths. We call her. <laughs> we'll talk about her in a separate podcast. Um, we just moved into a house in LA after years in an apartment, right? But we're growing a family and it's a, exciting time in that respect. So we only had so much furniture. You know, how are you going to furnish a three-bedroom house in a yard? And furnish was like a perfect solution for yeah. us. Not because like we founded the company, but also it was on moving day, we got our keys. Mm -hmm. Two hours later, we had our, you know, the furnish team come deliver and assemble 26 pieces of furniture That's awesome. at the home. And then well before like all of our boxes and everything got across town, like we were just lounging. It was it was honestly the best moving experience we've ever had. And uh, does a customer go on? I'm assuming you all have like a catalog similar to like what Amazon. They just kind of pick whatever they would want. They pick whatever they want. We do, have. Do you show the brand? So I think I saw you do Crate and Barrel. Or we do. do we do. So we do offer some Crate and Barrel product, okay. CB2 product. They also are a manufacturer for us. Yep. Because um, they're vertically integrated. So we have some of our own custom product that they Got manufacture it. for us. And most of our product today is in-house branded. Cool. And so it's either direct manufacturer relationships. And as a business gets bigger, you kind of have to go that vertical route, yeah. which is exciting for us and for our investors who like like the path to profitability. Yeah. Um, <laughs> matters. It matters, as you know. Yeah. Um, what did COVID teach you about your business model? Uh, I would imagine this was a uh, a strength for y'all as people started realizing they could move around and they didn't have to stay put. What, what did you learn during COVID? Tricky time. Yeah. You know, I remember literally, you know, because it's, it's March 2021 now, but if you rewind a year, no one had, had any idea what was actually going to happen in March and April. And so it was like a very much of a freeze for us. I was scared as hell. Scared as hell because you didn't actually understand like what this was. Is it going to be, you know, one of those like uh, movie driven plagues that wipes out the air? Like it was on, yeah. it was terrifying. And so there was like a lot of reflection and prayer and, <laughs> and other sides. So that's like first instinct. Um, you know, and then fast forward like into April, people were locked at home and they're like, you know, I, I want new decor. I want just new, new stuff. How long am I going to need a home workstation for? Like renting actually makes a ton of sense. And yeah. so you know, last May was an explosive month for us. Um, awesome. I mean, last year we, you know, we increased the business by triple digits in terms of growth. That's and awesome. it was a little bit of right place, right time being in the home furnishings category yeah. generally, which was exciting. Um, but, you know, home office from like a, item type or item category bucket shot up from, I think, you, know, you talk about bedroom being the top, living room, the dining room, then outdoor, then home office, like home office shot up to number one for most of last summer. How big is like, how many, how much furniture do Americans buy every year? Is this a, how, what's the TAM? What's it's, the total addressable it's market? It's great. I'm, I'm, I'm giving my VC pitch. Come on, so, baby. <laughs> it's about $120 billion market a year in the U.S., so Americans spend 120 billion. Is that on home furniture? Or does that include like office furniture and stuff like that? So it's it's that's that's uh, residential. Oh my! But gosh. that would include outdoor, include home office. I think there's a commercial furniture sales side, which is which is quite different. Um, it's not really what we do. Yeah, uh, we've had we have worked with some offices. Yeah, um, but I think residential is really where we've hung our hat today. We might obviously expand and outdoor yeah. is a category as well, but it's a big, it's a big market. It's 400 billion globally, but you know, to think of the U S only making up 6% of the world's population, but spending 25% of the, the amount on home furnishings. Like, Americans love stuff. And they do. And that, that, so the consumerism, you know, there's a lot of, um, a lot of aspects to our business that are not necessarily like, consumerism driven. I mean, the fact that we are a rental model and what we'll call a player in a circular economy, um, by definition, we reuse product, we recycle product. We're not about tossing product into landfill. You know, around 10 
million tons of furniture every year in the U.S. ends up in a landfill. Really? It's a very non-recyclable product because it's made up of so many different materials. And a yeah. lot of times, especially for product coming from Southeast Asia, there's a lot of chemicals that prevent some of the fabrics and the foams from being recycled generally. And so if you think about that, hey, how do I keep some of that product in a landfill? I mean, last year, we kept almost 300 tons of furniture out of landfill wow. through our recycling, uh, our, our, our refer, reuse, and recycling, uh, recycling. Okay, let's talk about that. Let's talk about I was going to ask, because that seems to me to be where, like, I just know, you know, even if you're not in college, sofa's going to get dirty, stuff's going to be, you know, people are going to do stuff. When you get, uh, you know, something back, how do you determine if it's still functional and what happens once you take it back to the warehouse and, and the whole recycling thing you just mentioned? So it's something we look at weekly. I think where we are now is around 97% of product that comes back to us is able to be refurbished in a like new state. We didn't have those numbers to start. Yeah. <laughs> we were like, you know, especially going back to that first trip to High Point, North Carolina, you had people tell you all these stories about how their product's super durable, that it'll work in a rental environment, then you get it in the door, you get it back from a customer, you move it a couple of times, like very dented, scratched, the seat on the foam has actually collapsed because the foam density wasn't up to the standards. Like you didn't actually know, like, what is foam density standards? Yeah. How should I think about this? And you fast forward again, we've hired out a pretty sizable team. We're now over 60, um, again, across across three markets, yeah. which is very exciting. But you have these supply chain curation standards where this product's going to hold up potentially for even 10 years. Yeah, And how do you put product into market that is not ever going to like, fall apart in the home? The seats aren't going to collapse. The upholstery is not going to stain. Like I can't use linen upholstery. Like right. white linen upholstery doesn't pass a red wine test. We right. do a wine test on all our sofas. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, which is very interesting. I'll come be a part too. of that test. It, totally. <laughs> I, we have some pretty impressive, especially in our first market, our logistics center out in LA is a pretty impressive operation at this point, yeah. which, is, which is really exciting. And so we have refurb techs who have all worked in the furniture space and what they can do to kind of hardwood surfaces or like cleaning upholstery is magical. Like yeah. something comes in, it looks all beat up and they're like, no, 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 like we got this. And then literally two hours later, we're, we're loading that up to another customer's home yep. and it's in like new state. So and you just spray it down, totally cleanse it. There's a lot of woodwork yeah. that can be done too. You have the sanding, you have the revarnishing, and it's really up to us in terms of like what's the ROI in terms of investing number of hours of labor into, you know, there's a, there's a pretty complex equation generally, which also says, hey, should we buy more of this product from this supplier because is it able to be refurbished? What are the most common things that people rent from y'all? Is it the sofa? Like what's your top, top piece of furniture a uh, bed frame bed frame bed frames yeah why bed i mean when i finished <laughs> when i finished school i slept on a mat i'm not i was going to say I'm not proud of this um, i'm on the mattress on the ground dude mattress on the ground and then you know you have friends over and they're like man this guy's still in college and i'm like hey well i you know <laughs> i don't want to be that person <laughs> you know i don't want to be that that guy um and so I need to go find a bed frame. And then you look at like a nice bed frame with like a nice upholstered, uh, a ni nice upholstered back. And you're like, wow, that's $900. No way. I'm on the floor. Um, but bed frames. Yeah. And people build their, um, build a bedroom around bed frames. And it's like, Hey, is there a one night stand or a two night stand? We actually have a really funny advertisement around yeah. that. I'm sure you can imagine. I've already, as soon as you said you it, I already <laughs> coming up with a joke. Uh, debate internally. The yeah. actual the actual average fluctuates between 1.45 and 1.52. So when you have add to carts, and so it's very much in the middle. Interesting. Um, interesting. Really interesting. Okay, so you're in Seattle and you're in LA, uh, and you only operate in those markets. And you've recently your third market is now kind of the DFW Metroplex. How do you think about? Obviously, LA was obvious. You were there. That was a great market. Why'd you go to Seattle? Why are you coming to Texas? And like, how are you thinking about growth? What are you looking for in a market? There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of different demographic information that we can look at that's public from, you know, uh, outlets like PwC or CBRE. Um, and if you would have asked me this question a year ago, you know, if I would have got out of a shell shock of like, what's going to happen? Yeah. Um, you know, I would have said we're going to be going to, you know, more coastal cities, San Francisco and New York, uh, maybe D.C. That's going to be like our big push. Last year, we ended up actually just 
investing in our product and holding off and seeing like, hey, how can we conserve and really make a big push? And what does that push look like now? Because the calculus has changed so much. Yeah. You know, Seattle was a natural market for us, given we had employees, very early employees that were based up there. There's explosive growth, especially in like a young professional population with all the employers in Seattle, obviously Amazon kind of being at the yeah. at the forefront of that. And in Texas, I mean, just looking at the mobility trends and demographic um, stats, I think you know, 200 plus thousand people are moving to DFW this year. That's like 5% of Chicago. Yeah. Is Dallas. <laughs> and I can't blame them, right? Yeah. Being down here for the past few weeks has been fantastic. Yeah. I mean, we're going to be, we're going to be live as of, you know, as of today when this podcast, <laughs> when this podcast airs, which will be very exciting. I love it, man. Um, and then obviously there's some other cities that are experiencing some great growth. And so you look at um, a number of demographic trends, but you also just say like, where are, like, where are my friends moving to? Yeah. Um, where like all my friends from San Francisco and New York, where have they moved to? So you're going to Miami next. So Miami is a different, like, it's a very <laughs> interesting, we'll see the staying power of Miami. Yeah. Separate podcast for that. But yeah, Miami is definitely on a roadmap. Cool. All right. When I was doing a lot of background, um, on preparing for this, your co-founder came from Amazon, your COO came from Amazon. And I was going through your cap table and you have Jeff Wilkie who runs, who's the CEO of consumer at Amazon. You said something earlier in the podcast where you basically said we're customer obsessed, Amazon. How has having a bunch of Amazonians on your team, one, impacted you, but just set this business up? Because uh, it seems like the skill sets that were that have made Amazon what it is, is exactly what y'all are going to need to be successful. Logistics, unit economics, the whole deal. What's that experience been like? Like I've never interviewed somebody on here that probably has such a a uh, view into the Amazonian way of thinking about uh, the world. It, oh, thanks. <laughs> I don't know if that's thanks or not, but I do think that you know the it's best, a compliment. The You're best, the CEO. Uh, yeah. Look, I think you want to surround yourself. My job, in many ways, is to surround yourself with the best people you can possibly get. Yep. Best investors, best teammates, because the best team wins. Ideas are cheap. I mean, you've had a lot of entrepreneurs on here and. You know, they, just like I, have not been the first people to have like a big potential idea. Like yeah. they might be the thousandth. They're just yeah. the one who wants to jump into the arena and make that decision. And part of that is surrounding yourself always with the best team. Yeah, There's a lot of uh, operating principles that Amazon has and they publish very widely. They interview candidates against those and they build their teams around those. I mean, but one of the cornerstones of the mentality is, is, is the day one mentality. And so every day is day one, like you're building something like it doesn't exist before and you're driving growth and you're driving your team and yourself in a way that you know, is very much not resting on your laurels per se. And that's what keeps the culture so innovative yep. and enables them to move really, really fast and act on things and like take bold swings and understand they're, you know, some of them might not work. Yeah. And then they take a step back and totally go another direction. Like some companies can't steer the ship that fast. Yep. And Amazon's proven that if you do steer the ship that fast, you know, not only are you going to conquer many markets, you're probably going to be broken up by the government at some point. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's almost a compliment. We're so great. We need to be broken back up. We had this debate. I had this debate at dinner actually in Fort Worth. <laughs> um, which is, you know, another, another conversation. Yeah. yeah. But so the team, you know, Lucas, my co-founder, and then Kristen Smith, who's our president and COO, you know, they have much more experience professionally than I do, but it was really fortunate and, you know, it's been a great learning curve for me to bring into, you know, what my investors will call adults, um, but I'll call like mentors in many ways into, into the business and, and build a company and a team that's doing the best work of their careers and doing better work than they even thought they could do. Yep. And that's part of the, you know, that's part of the Amazon mentality. You're going to do the best work of your career here and you're going to build your skill set exponentially. And that's really the environment that we're trying to create that's at awesome. the company. Do you think you'll like continue to hire a lot of am like Amazonians? We, we will hire people who could have worked at Amazon if they haven't current, like haven't been at Amazon in the past. I think there's a lot of parallels with our hiring process and yeah. the Amazon hiring process because we really believe they do it the right way. Yeah. It's a very thorough um, hiring process, which you really have to balance in a startup. Like, 
how long are you going to spend hiring for a role to get what we call a bar raiser, yeah. someone who will really raise the bar and, you know, in an engineering capacity, you call it a 10Xer um, versus, hey, I need this role and I need to run. Yeah. And that means you have to attract the right candidates early. And yeah. if you attract the right candidates early to do that, you just have to have a great up-level team to even start. Yeah. And so we've been very fortunate to kind of take that approach um, from the top and then build from there. And we've been really fortunate to attract great candidates. And this is a generic question uh, because it's always the, it's day one, but it's like the customer obsession, right? And it's, and I think, you know, I've read a lot of Jeff Bezos' stuff and he says, yeah, everybody says they're customer obsessed, but most people really aren't. Like, what does customer obsession mean? And maybe what are the things that you've learned over the last three or four years of working with people from Amazon is like, how do they look at customer obsession and how, do they, how does it not become something where they're bored? Like, is there constant meetings about, okay, let's talk about the customer today? Or like, how, how does that philosophy make its way through the organization? I can give you a couple examples. Yeah. You know, so early on, Lucas and I did our first 30 customer deliveries. Okay. And they were mostly, you know, some people we knew, some people we didn't know, but they knew people we knew. Yeah. And something that we found is like, what are the exact, like, how do you really leave like a very delightful experience on, you know, when you're leaving the home? Like you've just given people product for low monthly payments that they can be proud of. They have some optionality and flexibility around. You assemble it for them in their home or in the <laughs> warehouse prior to them. Like you've given so much of the service and then you leave, but what could have been better? Yep. And so the one thing that we found, which is like very small, is that if on a dining table, chairs don't actually fully like rest flat on all four legs, if there's any type of wiggle, yeah. people just are pissed off. Yeah. And it's like, you know, it, early on, like I'm sitting there for an hour assembling a couch for them and they're, you know, and then all these, you know, I have some helpers you bring in from <laughs> Thumbtack or TaskRabbit and then they're building these dining chairs. And then I just did all this stuff and they're like, well, you know, my dining chairs aren't flat. <laughs> and I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah. No, but it's uh, it's like, okay, like you want to ask those questions. And yep. so what we, what we do is we bring these little felt tips on every, you know, sometimes it's obviously not the chairs, it's the floor itself. But if that's what they're going to want and that's what their position, oh, he like, here, we'll add this felt tip here and here are a couple we're going to leave with you. Yep. And then it turns around the whole experience. It's a very small detail that, you know, if you're not asking the questions and what could have been better, yeah. you're never going to have that level of detail and feedback. And so I think customer um, customer feedback and customer surveys and customer development is is really core to the experience, especially when you're starting a new brand. Yeah. And so every customer we have, for better or worse, especially early on, we had two surveys go out, like what could have been better, like rate your experience, you know, tell me about this. And now we're more intermittent now that our customer base is in the thousands um, on, you know, what do we ask people? When do we ask people? But it's early to, it's important to find out early and ask the right questions at the right times. What else have you learned that like you didn't expect about people and how they want their furniture? Like there's got to be a couple more that you wouldn't have learned if you weren't customer obsessed. Like what are some other interesting kind of data points or things that you think about? Yeah, I think, you know, customer service, what I found is, you know, some of the, like one of the cornerstones for uh, customer loyalty mm -hmm. in a 21st century brand is definitely customer service. Yeah. I think the ability to return seamlessly is another one. Yeah. And we kind of understood those two very early on. And so like, how do you provide like a, a, a seamless returns and swaps process and make that core to the experience. Um, there's a the cost to that, but you can bake that into the monthly, you know, monthly subscription charge anyway. So we found the, a clever way to do that. But the customer service side, it's, I'd say, very responsive, very much onshore, very much relatable at many hours. And so we've really invested heavily in like how big that team is retaining and maintaining that team yeah, and having like a very fulsome script, understanding what are the main pain points that people ask for? How do you, uh, I, you know, I wish I had a story as good as, you know, Tony Shea and team at Zappos. Yeah. I don't know if you've heard the story where, you know, they're getting bought by Amazon for a billion dollars during diligence. One of the Amazon folks calls Zappos' hotline um, or customer service line just to see how good their customer service is because it's such a cornerstone to a yeah. customer-obsessed experience. And they asked to order a pizza. <laughs> and 
the Zappos person on the line, I mean, they have like a training manual and all these, um, it, you know, and, and, and all these, uh, all these frequently asked questions. And, you know, that's obviously not one of them. Yeah. However, through the lens of being customer obsessed, they say, you know, where are you based? And there's like, okay, I'm based in Las Vegas. And like, okay, oh, hold on one second. And, you know, the customer service representative from Zappos looked up the best pizza places to order from in Vegas. And they said, okay, here are the top three in town. Like, you know, and here are their phone numbers. And I'm not saying we don't have that story yet, but I love to have that story and diligence when Amazon's buying us for a billion dollars. That is awesome. <laughs> You're about to get somebody's going to listen to this and start ordering pizzas through punish.com. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it's a good story. It's a good story. And it's, uh, I mean, that, that company has been, that you know, was a great company and RIP, obviously. How do you handle, um, things that you don't want to hear, do they still hit your desk at a size of 60? Like, do you still stay very involved with customer feedback? That's something that, you know, I've always been in um, like real estate and when when tenants aren't happy, uh, it's taken me a while to build thick skin, especially in like a consumer business where, again, people are complaining about felt tips, not on a chair. How do you handle that? Or like, how do you think about it from the CEO's perspective? It'll always hit you. It'll yeah. always hit you. We have a customer feedback channel on our Slack that I look at probably too often. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we also have a, you know, we juxtapose that with a customer orders channel. And every time an order comes in, sort of like a bell rings. And it's, you know, it's That's obviously awesome. gotten the velocity's picked up a ton over the years. And it's, Just exci- ding, ding, ding. and it's exciting. And you're like, oh, that's awesome. And you get so jazzed. And then feedback is typically, you know, it's either positive or negative. Yeah. Um, but I think you really want it, you know, if someone has a negative experience, talk about the delivery and assembly and warehouse associates teams are very core and very much part of our company. Um, and they're all, you know, full-time staff with benefits. It's very important for us. And they're the face of our company. And that's yeah. something we learned really early on that if we're not providing, you know, that level of uh, training and positive experience in the home, then the whole brand could fall apart, regardless of like the great digital experience you have on an e-commerce front. And we actually, you know, we turned that around very quickly as we learned that, oh, like if you outsource everything for people that don't care versus not that, that like third parties don't necessarily care, they're just not incentivized right? the same way that we can incentivize people who work for us full time. Interesting. Super interesting. All right. Going back real quick to Jeff Wilkie. He's the head of Am- or he's now the CEO of Amazon Consumer. Bezos has taken, you know, he's he's retiring. He's kind of falling into, you know, further back. And Jeff's kind of been, you've started to hear about him more. Is there anything interesting that you've learned from him? I mean, you've talked about a lot of Amazonian principles, but he is an investor in your company. And has he given you any advice that's like, man, I think about that all the time? I, just one, one, one story there. And my co-founder, Lucas, um, who was pretty early at Amazon, he actually got to, he worked pretty closely with Wilkie and he got to, um, he got to pitch Jeff Bezos an idea for cloud drive and an acquisition for uh, Dropbox back when Dropbox was, was very small. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so Lucas really had that relationship and, you know, what's the downside of asking you know, someone so senior and exciting and again, customer obsessed, like was found like, was so core to building what Amazon is and what Amazon's turned out to be. You know, getting a pitch with him was super exciting. Yep. And sent him some materials in advance. And we did it over the phone because, you know, Jeff Wilkie was in Seattle and we were down in LA. Um, and the first conversation there was like 45 minutes, which is a lot of time for someone who, you know, manages millions of people and hundreds of billions of dollars. <laughs> around. Um, and he, I don't know how deeply he had thought about our business, but he already knew our business better than we did. Yeah. Like he's like, okay, here are the operational stats and KPIs I'd be monitoring if I were you. How are you approaching monitoring these? And how are you thinking about like scaling these over time? And what do you think their thresholds could be? And I'm like, well, one of those we've thought about, but the other two are great. Thank you. And I'm like, <laughs> done. Like, was that the right thing to say? Yeah. <laughs> like, but I think, you know, someone like that would know most businesses in logistics or consumer commerce better than any founder would because they've you know built something so special and amazing. Yeah. Um, you know, and since then he's been, you know, Jeff's been an amazing mentor to our present C- COO, Kristen Smith. They have a very long-standing relationship. She worked very closely with him for about a decade 
early days Amazon spinning up the first iteration of what is now Amazon Prime and same day delivery, um, first on a regional basis. So that's obviously kind of the physical goods logistics aspect of that product. You know, Kristen's obviously very proud of and was core to that original team that was run by Jeff Wilkie. And this was, you know, 15 years ago, back when, you know, they were just getting out of books only. But the yeah. vision was always kind of to own global commerce. So. Yeah. God, it's awesome, man. It's, you've really surrounded yourself with good people. Did you raise, um, did you raise, was it a series A of 30 million? Was it last year? Am I botching that a little bit? So we've raised 45 to date. Okay. 45 million to date across across three separate rounds. And so they've and, been at different sizes along the way. When was your last raise? It was last year? Last year. Was that tough to raise money in a pandemic? Tough to raise money in a pandemic, but we had some good tailwinds. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we brought in a fund called Coastal Adventures yep. run by you know, a gentleman named Vinod Coastal, founded on microsystems, very deep, you know, very deep and well respected in the investment community. And his founding partner at the fund, David Wyden, has become like a great backer of ours. He's in our boardrooms. He's he pushes me very. I'm actually chatting with him a bit later. Uh, he pushes us really hard, and that's like what he's meant to do. Um, yep. But again, adding to the roster of folks in the room that are. Um, have deeper experience than I do and yeah. I can learn from. And in normal circumstances or other circumstances, I would work for gladly as opposed to them having them either work for or alongside me. That was my next question is what have you, like, what are your best VCs do for you? You mentioned that he's on the board. Like, I don't know, let's just take that call. He pushes you really hard. What does pushing you really hard mean? Making you think bigger, holding you accountable to certain things. Like what, what do you mean by that? I think from a, uh, we could talk about the like the roles in the boardroom, um, mm -hmm. and you have an an investor, financial like investor that's very like financially savvy, but he's been an investor for so long, and then you have like an ex operator. Yeah. So as part of the round last year, we had the opportunity to add one of both, and so on the coast the side, you have someone who's seen and built businesses from Square to DoorDash and had amazing returns, and it's one of the like the top ten VCs in Silicon Valley. Yeah. And, you know, that's like a lot of, lot of sh big shoes to fill or big Tacovas to fill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about what we're wearing Texas, right baby. now. Um, and I think, you know, pushing in accountability and building yourself as a source of truth is always like an opportunity and challenge, um, but also like something very exciting you can do as an entrepreneur with such um, thought, thoughtful and experienced people at the table. You know, we also had the opportunity to bring in a really seasoned operator as an independent director in the boardroom last year, a woman by the name of Carrie Cooper. Okay. She was former CMO of Walmart.com. She most recently ran a company uh, called Rothy's out of the Bay, sustainable commerce in, in shoes and accessories. And there's just so many great fits to her at the business. And I think from a like ideation and go to market and strategic perspective, you know, her plugging in on product and marketing and being a sounding board and say, oh, you know, when Walmart bought this company called ModCloth, they used these three strategies to really spin up email marketing and to really drive higher conversion across the websites. And this is how they designed their cart. And this is the like the the CRM they had behind the scenes. And so having her plug in with those insights has just been fantastic and yeah. phenomenal for us. And again, it really speaks to, hey, you want you want the best people at the table at all times because that's really going to up-level your, your business and your brand. And so I think the investor versus operator mentality is something that we always, you know, we've tried to balance on the boardroom side too. And is a, is a lot of it you reaching out to them like, hey, I need to chat or are they pretty good about checking in with you? Like, how does that dynamic work? You can pick up the phone anytime and call them. Well, it's 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 balanced. Yeah. Um, we more text than call. But yeah, yeah, it's twenty twenty one. It's twenty twenty one. I mean, you have quarterly board meetings, and so you understand that. Hey, like these are the things that you people are going to want to talk about. Um, here's what you talked about last time. Like, what's the progress against those? Like, what are some new challenges or tailwinds that has emerged that have emerged? And yeah, you know, I think you at least have a quarterly cadence, but we try to make it much more than that. Yeah, um, because there's ways to leverage your extended team yep all right um we are uh heading out of a pandemic we're much more on the other side of it than we're on the inside of it what do the next two years look like for you we're, we're sitting here in dallas you and i've gotten to become friends over the last six months 
Um, clearly, you have product market fit. You're actually profitable in the markets that you're in. Is that right? We have a path. You have a not path qu- to profitability. Quite. We yeah, could yeah. pull back substantially, but but I but, I, but I read a lot, and you you yeah. said you you were kind of given a blessing in 2020. You got to focus internally and just totally. work on the things that that worked. Uh, probably making when you do really start to scale even better. So, like, what do what do you hope to achieve the next like three or four years? Looking at the mission of the company and just extending that as far as it can go, so to speak. Yeah. First involves like how do you get your business in the top twenty markets in the U.S. Yeah. Because you know if you really want to provide a lifestyle service to folks who are moving at a somewhat regular cadence. You can't not be in Denver and New York and Boston and D.C. because people are going to be moving in and around those cities and then back to Miami and Phoenix and Dallas and L.A. and Seattle right. over some, some, some period of time. And so today, those customers have to churn off yeah. and I lose that revenue. And then yeah. I have to go buy a new customer yeah. to like repurpose that same furniture, so to speak. And so first, you need the distribution, um, but you really have to balance that with what we call like local local logistics, yeah, which is, again, another Amazon principle, right? If you think about what Amazon's done, they were getting a lot of flack early on in like the early 2000s around, hey, why are you building up all these distribution centers? And why can't you just do everything like ship it through FedEx, like small parcel? They said, no, we want to be as close to the customer as we can, because then we can maximize the experience and we can maximize the upsell, maximize the lifetime revenue. And so that's a very interesting approach that they pioneered in a meaningful way. We think we can do that exact same thing too. And in some ways we have to, yep. to provide the experience that we promise to customers. But it's a very differentiated experience if you think about furniture generally and how yeah. and how companies have managed furniture to date and why it's such a like a big market and big opportunity. So I think being in a top 20 metros over the next few years is a is a cornerstone yeah. to what we what we're trying to do. And I think again we're fortunate to have the support from a lot of smart people and the smart investor group to help to help us achieve that. That's one thing. And then I could talk about a lot of like extensible, like extensible longer term roadmap things that we're not quite talking about yet. That's fine. We'll do that on part two. Part two will be good. Um, in Miami. In Miami. Not baby. in the summer. No, I know. <laughs> um, well, then on that one, then then on that one topic, and I'll and I'll keep uh I'll stop asking so much about logistics. I'm just fascinated by Amazon. What does local logistics mean for Furnish? And why do you guys, why should someone like, let's just say in Dallas, feel more confident in what you're doing? Y'all are able to get here, obviously get your warehouse, hire your team here. But like, what does local logistics really mean for you right now as it sits? A couple of different ways to approach it. I think if you go to a website right now, yeah. Or let's say West Elm, let's say even Ikea and try to find a desk. Like the back order time on a product is sometimes four months. Yeah. And because there's supply chain challenges abroad, but they'll still take your money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they'll still take your money and say, hey, you know, in four months you'll have, you know, you'll have, uh, you'll have what you ordered. I think from a customer experience side, that's unacceptable. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's. You know, you have you have certain SLAs, and but that's how the category has worked. Like that's how the retail experience has always worked for furniture. And so, what we provide everything on our site is, hey, you can have this delivered and assembled for free and arranged in seven days. Yep. And we're able to do that because we own the logistics, and also kind of we're very buttoned up on the local supply chain. Like we're not showing product that you know has hasn't yet been shipped from China. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's we have access to that. You know, and sometimes if you can't meet an SLA by a couple of days, like that's okay. But our promise to customers is is seven days. So yeah. that's one advantage that we have. And again, it all comes down to the customer experience. But the actual logistics setup is, you know, it's interesting. We you talk about how to set up a warehouse where a circular economy model, so our warehousing actually flows like a circle. Right, you have ingress of new product or return of product that then goes to a section of the warehouse which is you know earmarked for quarantine, then a section of the warehouse which is earmarked for refurb, then it's staging and stocking, and then it's um, and then it's stocking, and then it's staging out the other side of the warehouse or at the other like adjacent 
uh, door where a uh, product gets loaded onto the truck as soon as it can to go out the door to another customer. And so the logistics center flows like a circle and we very much try to measure our throughput. How quickly can we move product through the warehouse? And that's an important like operational metric, which you know Jeff Wilkie obviously pointed out before we had ever even thought about it. And before all this, had you ever even been in a world to think about that kind of stuff? Oh, absolutely not. No. So like this, this is, is why you hire, this is why you hire a great team. Yeah. Yeah. To do it. I think what we found out early on is there's a big opportunity in this model from a consumer's perspective, and there's going to be a lot of demand. So what do you need to do to fulfill that demand? Like yeah. what are the fixed costs associated? Does the business model work? Um, and it obviously works very well at scale yep. in a pretty meaningful way. And there's a lot of like scale drivers. One other question then, it seems like it could be capital intensive. Like you're going to be buying a ton of furniture that you're leasing out. How do you think about that? I mean, if it scales and everybody on the planet wants to buy furniture from you, you could own a hundred billion dollars worth of furniture pretty quickly. Uh, what a fantastic, you know, what a problem fantastic to have. problem. I mean, that'd be a champagne problem. So if you have a hundred billion dollars that you're doing, you're doing 80% of the market in the U.S., which would be, talk about uh, consolidating a very fragmented market. That said- But that would be annually. Like if it, if it starts stacking up year after year though, you could own a hundred billion dollars worth of furniture in 10 years. You could, you could. And the one of the core things we look at is how much of your furniture is utilized in a given market. Right. So I'm not, warehousing a hundred billion dollars of furniture for sure like ideally i'm where warehousing eight billion dollars of furniture right and all the other product is in apartments or homes that people are paying me on and it's not a cost center for me right? so you, just, you guys just have like a credit facility keep buying and it's like a lease payment you do have so we do have some debt capital as well where it That's is awesome. a credit facility because you came from finance i did come from finance i'm a reformed investment banker, as yeah. I like to call myself. But I did leverage finance. I think that's uh, that's been helpful in terms of how yeah. do you speak the right language with lenders, you know, and how do you build a, a business that will require some f- like cap structure where you could have mes debt, you could have um, kind of first lane, you have a revolver, and then how do you get that to work with the equity? And you're obviously a real estate guy yeah. through and through, so you you're understand my language. all types of this. And so a lot of it's like, how is my background at JP Morgan relevant to build a startup? It's like, actually, yeah, it is, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in some respect. Um, all right. Some uh, some fun personal ones uh, and we'll bring it home. Do you have a childhood experience that uh, you remember, whether it's an, a moment in time or maybe a sport you played or something that kind of shaped who you are today? Like, had I not done that, I might not be where I'm sitting right now. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I've heard you ask this question of others. I just started. Um, I think one of like, the most formative experiences I had was, was with sports. You know, I had the opportunity to play you know, basketball through four years of college as well uh, outside New York City. Oh, and you did play basketball? I did, I did, I did. And, you know, our mutual friend, James Bashara. Yeah. You know, has asked to play with me, but I, you know, I just don't want to dunk on him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I like the guy too much. Yeah. And fair enough. I, um, that taught me so much in terms of time management, discipline, working with a team, surrounding yourself. Like we had not, we had a, you know, I, as a sophomore and junior was playing, we were playing a more and more meaningful part on our college team and we were getting better and better but in but we had a rookie that was coming in and he was better than i was and he was going to take my spot yeah my senior year (laughs) and i was very bullish on recruiting him because he was going to up level what we call the franchise yeah and he turned out to be in all a first team all american that's awesome. By the time he rolled through the program and elevated us, you know, multiple NCAA tournament appearances during his time. And it was a fantastic recruit. Yeah. And I took him under my wing both academically yeah. and um, on the athletic side. Yeah. And I think that was a my first real experience in like what's the like if you're thinking for the long term, you know, how do you 
how do you how do you do that? What's the right way to do that when it doesn't always seem like it's the best personal decision at the time? And I don't know if that's like a real parallel in terms of not replacing myself as CEO of the business, but how do you make like put yourself in the best position by surrounding yourself with the best team? Yeah. That's a good, I mean, I haven't thought about that story in a while. Yeah. His name's Richie and he's 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 fantastic and having a great professional career right now, too. That's awesome, man. Hey no Richie. Surprise. What's up, Richie? Um do you have a morning routine? I did not have one uh, ever in my whole life. And then COVID, uh, that kind of changed. Now I go, I get up every morning and go walk for 90 minutes. You do anything in the morning to get going? Yeah, morning routine. Um, <clears throat> COVID really <laughs> threw, threw wrenches into that, but we still find a way. My wife and I love to work out together. Yeah. And it would be, it would be a morning run. Cool. Or like an exercise routine. And I think that, Gives you a lot of energy for the day. Yeah. Um, and you can't really do that end of day because you're kind of wiped out. Yeah. Especially when you have like 13 meetings. And I just had Matteo Franceschetti on the podcast with Eight Sleep, and he advised us do it's not awesome. work out before bed. It's not good. It's, I mean, the things you learn yeah. in, in your line of business. I love it, man. I get to sit behind this mic and just learn from really smart people like you. Um, all right. One more. Is there a book that you've read that kind of impacted you? A lot of books, but I think a ton of books. I think uh, that's so, that's that's what we ask all new hires, by the way. Like, what's your favorite book and why? Yeah. Um, And you learn a lot about people. I'm stalling while I think of mine. Yeah. Um, We'll edit. I I think the, (laughs) I think what I'd say is uh, it's a book called Against the Gods. Okay. It's a, on its surface, it's a it's a math history book. Yeah. But really, it talks about the journey of human thought through working past a point in time, which is really like the you know six let's say sixteen hundreds ish break point where people got comfortable with predicting future events in terms of probability because it was no longer determined all by God. Right. You know, but before that Renaissance period in time. Human thought had not, or the mathematics specifically, had not taken that step because that step just logically didn't make sense because your future was already determined, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but when you take that step and you start to challenge, you know, previously held assumptions around religion. Otherwise, again, we could talk about this over a beer many, you know, yeah, for a while. Part, part three. Part, part three. Let's do it. <laughs> um, that's a fascinating book, and yeah. I think challenging, you know, what the takeaway there would be, you know, challenging previously held assumptions in a meaningful way gets you to a point where, you know, kind of a more micro application is like, oh, this is a best practice. And it's like, there's no such thing as a best practice. There's a really good practice, but it doesn't mean you can't improve on that practice. Yep. Um, and to ultimately get to this constant pushing of a goal line, it's kind of a micro application of challenging assumptions. But I thought that book was fascinating. That's awesome. And that ties right back to customer obsession. It's like, it's not what you think the customer wants. It's what the customer wants. And you got to keep kind of learning. And what they want today will be different than five years from now. The world's going to keep evolving. Putting it all together, Chris. Yeah, here we go. You always do. How can people reach you or reach Furnish if they want to uh, either get in touch with you on Twitter or something or they want to rent something? Yeah, I'm on Twitter at Emily Barlow. Um, Furnish.com, F-E-R-N-I-S-H. We change the spelling. We want the dictionary to change the spelling as well. Yeah. <laughs> we like to, do, you know, at first we were delivering a fern with every order uh, yeah. because it was like, you know, green living too. And so we still do some por- portion of that, which is interesting. Um, and then Michael at Furnish.com. And you cool. can find us. We have really dialed in SEO. I love it, man. As you say, especially locally here in DFW. Coming to DFW, they are launching, I believe, this week, and you'll be able to rent furniture, uh, or if you're a multifamily owner, which I have a ton of friends here that are, uh, I'd I'd highly recommend this uh, as something that you offer your tenants. So, Michael, thanks for joining me today, brother. Thanks for having me on. This is awesome. Great to meet.